Me. And welcome, Hi. welcome everybody to Wild Ginger Running. Um, this is a live chat with Mimi Koka at a slightly different time um, because of the time difference between here and Sweden. So thank you so much, Mimi, for joining us today. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing good. <laughs> it's a bit, uh, it, it, I'm a bit tired. I was just telling you that, oh no, it's so late, the time we have. I go to bed at nine. <laughs> but this is okay. Now I'm looking forward to it. Brilliant. So we'll try and make sure that you're finished well before nine o'clock um, in, no, in your yes, time. It's very important. <laughs> yeah, but you're actually in Chamonix right now, aren't you? You just said the snow is starting to fall. Yeah. So we came here for uh, some uh, spend, to spend some time here for the winter uh, to do some skiing, uh, skimo training, and so we uh, we've only been here for a few days, oh, and then we go for spring. We go back to Sweden again. So ah oh, okay. Then, so. then we'll see. We'll probably have the camp for the summer. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> wow, such a movable lifestyle, just following what you want yeah. to do. Um, so just for anybody who's not that familiar with, with who you are, because you've only come onto the, uh, the trail running scene over the last few years and done really, really spectacularly well. Um, just tell us all how you got into trail running in the first place. So um, it's actually, I, I started running more, like I've always been super, what I would say interested is not uh, is an understatement. I've been obsessed with out, the outdoors all my life. And I was, uh, I was never re doing any like organized sports growing up, but I was a scout and I skied and uh, all about canoeing and hiking uh, with friends and just uh, when I was um, in my teens I was really into free diving you know without wow. ox oxygen oh yes <laughs> but it's that all, way you go yeah, down all of this diving and you dive as far as you can yeah. without oh wow yeah. that's interesting but I, <laughs> No, but it's super dangerous. I was oh. too, I was too scared, so I never, I never took it anywhere. I would just um, always like spending time with friends and being in the water. That interested me. So all of these acti outdoor activities were just like it was never any competition or anything like that. It was just like for the beauty of being outside and the beauty of the activity. But somehow I, yeah. I grew up, I <laughs> went to university, I became a grown up uh, and life started to like take more space and then I um, decided uh, I wanted I, I wanted to uh, do something that's in Sweden called like a Swedish classic when I was approaching 30. I had just gotten married and had a lot to do in my work and stuff so I was really like I wanted like a physical um so, something uh, was well, so, sorry sometimes I will, I will i will lose uh, english words sometimes because it's i have to translate everything in my head um uh, but i wanted a physical challenge uh, so i decided to do like something that's really uh, famous in sweden called the swedish classic and it is uh, something you do during one year you run they call it a trail race, but it's actually a dirt road race, a 30k <laughs> race. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's the biggest one in Sweden. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, then you swim a big open water swim and you bike a 300 kilometer bike race around one of the bigger lakes. And you also do the Vasaloppet, which is a 90k Nordic ski race. Oh, wow. So I was like, oh, uh, uh, I, I want to do that. And then I, so I decided I would do this 30k race as like the first the start because you need to do everything within one calendar year to do like the classic. Yeah. So I decided I needed to do that. So I realized I need to start running. <laughs> <laughs> And I remember still thinking, like, how is it possible to run 30, 30 kilometers? Like, it's so long. How is it even possible? But I started running, and it's just, um, I was living in Stockholm, uh, both in Stockholm and Malmö at the time. And it's Stockholm, it's really, it's big, the biggest city in Sweden, but it's really easy to get, like, access to really nice nature. 
so I started to run uh, in a like um, a green area uh, 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 close to where I lived, and I just fell in love with getting trail running. <laughs> um, and uh, so I never did any of the other stuff in the Swedish classic. I just focused zoomed in on this <laughs> running stuff, and I've been yeah. So I I sort of back then I found so that's how I found my like my outdoors thing, um, and then I kept doing it for a couple of years. You know, training a couple of times a week, maybe doing a race a year, and uh, just like uh, having it as a fun side thing. But then in uh, the end of 2013, um, me and my husband decided that we wanted to like shift lifestyle because mm -hmm. we were working a lot. And yeah, we had a house that was way too big for us. And <laughs> we decided that, no, but you know, it's, um, we just felt both of us that we had perhaps gotten a little, and I wouldn't say boring, but we weren't exactly like living. We kind of felt that we were living, just living without any like clear direction that we had decided on. Uh, so we decided that, so we, we thought what uh, hard <laughs> for a few weeks about what we actually wanted to do and decided that we wanted to live a simpler life with more like um, time for passion and uh, just less, less stuff and more time. Mm. That's the easy way. So, uh, and then that, and the deal was because we made like a, we like to do like projects and contracts so we decided that each one could pick like one passion to pursue mm -hmm. in this uh, simple uh, route uh, this uh, simplification project <laughs> and I then I so I started to thinking because I had been doing some races and it um with trail running and it it had gone well so i started to think oh maybe it, there's an opportunity here maybe i'm good at this mm. so i think i will try and become a runner <laughs> a real one <laughs> like to train more structurally structured and uh, like go for for trying to finish like big um real uh, some big races in Sweden and so so that's what I did in 2014 and yeah that's how it started <laughs> yeah well it started off well I'm just going to read out some of these results that I've been finding about you um so so you only got into trail running in like 2013 kind of time and then in 2014 you came third in the Falraven, no, not Falraven. <laughs> There's a brand yeah. called that, isn't there? There's a the Fal yeah. Marathon, <laughs> the Fal yeah. Marathon. It's like the, big, the biggest uh, like alp, alpine mountain marathon in Sweden. So. Wow. Yeah. So yeah, to come third in that is that's pretty pretty good for a first year of running. And then you're on the podium in three more Swedish ultras. You were second um, at a 90k race. You qualified for the national team in 2015 so you went to the world trail championships and you came eighth and this is all just in the first couple of years um and then um you've been skiing in the winter haven't you and then running in the summer um and you've had some really good wins like in 2016 you won four ultras including uh, this was the biggie wasn't it the ccc um yeah where you came sure. in really far ahead of everybody else on the course um and so yeah just tell me a little bit about that because that's when you really kind of blasted onto the trail running scene isn't it and people were like oh wow this this Mimi Kotka she's she's one to watch isn't she yeah I I think that um uh it was so like being uh I finished second in an ultra race in 2014 and got invited for the world championships. And that was maxi race in Annecy, which is like super technical, true <laughs> ultra tra French ultra trail, which is kind of my favorite races or the Alpine ones. So, should <laughs> um, so that was like a shock to me because then we were living in the south of Sweden and it was all flat. So I had like no mountain legs. <laughs> what? so ever but I just I mean um, I 
I fell in love with with the ultra trail specifically in max during maxi race so I just and then you know then the UTMB races come up on your radar and I decided I wanted to do the CCC in 2016 which felt like a huge <laughs> it's pretty huge, long isn't it <laughs> yeah <laughs> It felt long, but also like very, yeah, like uh, it was with all the ups and downs. Yeah, uh, but very yeah, hilly. I trained, I, I trained a lot in the in the Alps, so I kind of broke broke the legs enough to manage it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and what did it feel like when you came over that finish line? Having, uh, yeah, it's probably was that the biggest race of your life so far. Um, yeah, I. Yeah, I think so. I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> That's been so many probably, since then. <laughs> I probably felt happy. <laughs> yeah. Sure. No, but I don't. Uh, I I remember more from the races than from the finishing lines. There oh. are some finishing lines that are special, of course. I, yeah, yeah. I, I have to. Yeah, I do remember it because there's so much people in Chamonix watching okay. those races. So it's a very like the whole. Um, running through the city was really special because it was a lot of people so that felt really cool yeah, yeah it yeah it must be brilliant um and then you've just gone from strength to strength so like in 2017 there was the tds the course record there which you won by two and a half hours which is amazing um and then you've won <clears throat> the mont blanc 90k twice as well and um, yeah, Madeira Island Ultra Trail and the Maxi Race Annecy in 2018. Um, but then um, in 2018, then you decided to do the UTMB and then things didn't quite go to plan there, did they? Um, Can you tell us a little bit about what happened in the UTMB in 2018? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I had, um, I had a lot of like, the Marathon Mont Blanc is one of my favorite races. Um, but I, uh, during the 2018 uh, race, I had a kind of a nasty fall in the end. Uh-huh. Uh, I, I fell a few times, but that's a nasty one in the end, and I broke two fingers and hurt my knees. Ooh, wow. um, but, you know, I had, because of CCC and TDS, I had built up towards, I mean, of course, I wanted to, then it felt like, oh, the next step should be UTMB, but really I had, so I, I was really like, in 2018 I was so focused on that race (laughs) but the thing is I was very I I was in a lot of pain after Marathon Mont Blanc uh, Mm -hmm. with the fingers and with the knees and I with the knee and I didn't sleep in during the nights because of the pain and Uh. I just but I was so like bam 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 I just trained and trained and trained and my husband was uh, I don't think you're too healthy you should probably go and see a doctor and I was like, no I will not go and see what's wrong with me I'll do that after you can be okay he, he backed off but the truth is I actually no but the truth is I actually cried uh, before the start because oh. uh, I knew in my heart that uh, I wasn't uh, I wasn't in a good place physically to do it um and uh i had a i mean i i i stopped the race because uh i knew that if i would have continued i probably wouldn't have been running more so so that's it's uh it's a very like it's a bit sad to think about it that i did that to myself but i'm also like some you, I I know that you can have like regrets about not finishing races and stuff, but this is not one of those. It's it was the right thing to do. The wrong thing was to start. <laughs> so, yeah, you, you have to try decided, though. Yeah, but no, but I also decided that I wouldn't do that again. So I I if I'm because it's a, these races take take a lot out of you, and you have to be okay when you start. Huh? So I decided I wouldn't put my I wouldn't do I would wouldn't do that again. So if I start, I'm okay, and then I I go until I can't move anymore. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> but you. But, it's, but 100 miles is like my shit distance, and oh. that's why I need to do. It. <laughs> yeah. I I can't I can't 
can't wrap my wrap my head around it. It's um, yeah. It's, I've done it twice now, and it's just been wow. Well, well, it's not too it's shabby. I mean, you came 20th at the Ultra Trail du Mont Blanc yeah. this year. Um, I actually saw you out on the course. I was filming and I was like, hi, baby, like that. that we, what you won't remember because a million people <laughs> said that to you. But I saw you go past in the dark <laughs> um, at Notre Dame de la Gorge. I saw you there and you looked okay. really good. It was great to see you. <laughs> um, yeah, but it, yeah, I just... Uh... I, I'm not sure I cracked the. I mean, um, I should be able to to at least. Uh, so I, I will continue to do this hundred mile thing until uh, <laughs> at least I feel I I raced it well. Mm -hmm. And you know, it doesn't matter if you, but you know that it's uh, it can be uh, a satisfaction to get. Uh, finish top 20 if you know inside that you did a good race and yeah. you did your best um, and so it's that feeling inside that I'm uh, searching for I want to feel that I did it like <laughs> I took my capacity and I put it in there and I did it so that's yeah. um, what like, I'm waiting for. Yeah, like you <laughs> felt, like you said, you felt at the Grand Trail Cormier when you came second, and you just felt like, even though you came second, you had a really great race, and you felt like you yeah. worked really hard, and you're really proud of that. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I think, uh, well, the Grand Trail Cormier, I finished second overall, so I was the first lady. Oh, yeah. oh, okay, yeah. fantastic. I've just written down second at Grand Trail Cormier. <laughs> That's even better. <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> is, second overall yeah, but, is fantastic. And so many more ladies are, are doing results like that these days. It's amazing. Yeah, it's really cool though. Yeah. Yeah. But um, no, but uh, one of the nicest uh, races, race experience I've had was Templiers in 2017. Um, and uh, back then I I finished fifth, but I really like felt that I because it's a speed race for me, and I really felt I I did good in my heart, and then I just felt like part of a really cool community because I, Ida and Emily were racing, and Ruth that's a good friend friend as well, and just all this powerful women. I don't mind be I mean trailing behind them because I I felt that I reached uh, that I did good for me. Yeah? So it's uh, it's different. Yeah. You you I mean this is this is a sport you do. This is a crazy sport you do for for like the feeling inside. It's not it's not glamorous enough or anything to be <laughs> be for anyone else uh, really <laughs> yeah it's nice that you talk about the feeling inside as well because I'm often saying that to people it doesn't matter like where you come in the race or how slow or no. how, don't be obsessed with your speed like just like enjoy yourself really yeah but I would say though that uh, that feeling inside is also something you cannot trick yourself no matter what level you're on because mm -hmm. it's like part of finishing a race an ultra race for example even if it's your first one or whatever is preparing mm -hmm. the best you can yeah so i think uh, that um i wouldn't say it's it, i think no matter what level you are there's a difference between just like showing up and and uh, of course you can grit it out and get a lot out of out of that but i think the true like value inside lies in that you prepared and that you like really did the training the best you could and then you did the race and you yeah. pushed through through yeah through. so i think the experience the experience is much much bigger if you have if you have done the homework before you go to the race so to speak you know yeah. do you understand what i mean yeah, yeah definitely like yeah. enjoy your training enjoy your racing even more yeah exactly. yeah yeah because i think you can sort of uh, uh, and that's indifferent of the result or what le what level of running you are doing but it's like the, the experience grows with how much preparation you put in there Yes, 
Definitely. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. Um, and that leads me on nicely, actually, because um, I wanted to talk a bit about your training because I've got several people's questions on your training. Oh. Um, and I also, we also need to talk about the um, the, the amazing Moon Valley book um, because of yeah. course you are a nutritionist as well. So we need to cover that uh, a little bit coming up. Um, but first we'll ask one of the, one of my audience's questions. Um, this is about your training, Mimi. So he would like to know, Adrian... Camilleri would like to know if you train by keeping a certain pace or do you train by using your heart rate um because he's just saying trail running is really hilly so it might it's difficult to maintain a pace um so do you use your heart rate for your training yeah how does it work for you yeah. <laughs> so I've from the beginning I, I run by feel and just like spending hours outside running so I think that builds some sort of base, but then later on I've used um, not not no speed is not that, that's depressing. <laughs> <laughs> if you do if you live in a in the in a mountainous area, that's really so. Um, I either I uh, count time like accumulated hours or meters of uh, elevation, ah. or I use a heart rate monitor. Ah, and what are you looking for specifically? Like, do you have like different. three different types of run per week, or how do you structure your training? I it's very different during the year. So I have, um, and also because, like you said in the beginning, I'm new to this, so I'm like both learning and adjusting and adapting and figuring out what's working, and just learning. For example, last year, look. Last this summer, I learned a lot about uh, heart rate monitor running because I got a really nice uh, heart rate monitor that I started using, and then I wanted to learn more about that. But so I don't have um, any correct answers. I <laughs> can, <laughs> um, but it depends a lot season and the year uh, year to year. Last year, I ran more on the heart rate than I've done before. Yeah. Um, and so do you do like... Because I had a, like a, I had a code, uh, I had a schedule that I was following that was based on heart rate zones. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that was completely new to me. But, ah. but, but it was very, that's, it, I've, I've, uh, before I ever had like tried to have a coach write the training for me and it haven't worked because it's been too specific and I mean I have to fit in all this other stuff with life and um, but this was very like just plain uh, um, heart rate and then I could like choose when and how to do it <laughs> so that yeah. was kind of that was a convenient way actually to work with with a coach yeah. yeah. So did you have like say, oh, I've got to do two runs in zone one today and then like a, a fast run in zone five or something like that? Yeah, but it's more, it's more like blocks uh, and maybe specific blocks for an ultra. Then you do a lot of um, hours, mm. really. And then maybe you, you do like... Uh, well, I'm not an expert at this at all, so I will. I will just be mumbling. <laughs> what you sh I, I, won't, I shouldn't even talk about this. I'm sorry. Yeah, we'll we'll talk more about the nutrition. <laughs> I'm such terrible, but I, I. One thing I do know is, for me, it works really well to mix up the yeah. year with to do skiing in the winter and just uh, not run all the time. That, I think, is good. <laughs> yeah, I've definitely heard that's really good for injuries. And I, I just wish we had a ski season over here in the UK. Well, apart from sometimes in Scotland, a bit of dodgy snow. But, yeah, yeah. I, I think we should it's all like move over to... We should all get in a van and move over to where you are in Chamonix. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a quite an interesting question here about um, 
from uh, the same guy, um, Adrian Camilleri. Um, he wants to know how you, um, how do you do any scouting of the course before the race day? Because um, usually when us guys run a race, there's people in front of us, so we can just follow them. But if you're going to be leading the race, or you know, or if it's a small field and you don't see the person ahead, how do you know where to go? Like, do you recce the courses at all beforehand? Uh, well. Courses, uh, ultra courses need to be well marked <laughs> because I've never <laughs> done a race without getting a bit lost. Oh, okay. uh, even because you get so stupid, so you just lose the. Uh, and sometimes when I've been really tired, all almost all of my energy has gone to just focusing on where's the next sign, where <laughs> am I lost? Am I lost? Am I lost? So good marking is is crucial when you are when your brain start uh, shuts starts to shut down no but um it it depends uh, some races i've done twice and then you know that because it's different to do a course i think a course recce is really nice but it's also i know it's different between people because some people do not like to see the course before they run it because they want the experience and the, like the they don't want to have they want su the surprise um for me i like to do a course rookie but it also it's very different from racing a course yeah so I, i'm not sure i'm not sure it makes such a big difference uh but racing a uh, race and then doing it again that's a real like then you get then you know the race um, so that's my experience is that if I if I race the race and do that again, then I have a good understanding of of the race, so to speak. Yeah. 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 So you wouldn't specifically go out and recce the course; you just race it once and then maybe race it uh, next yeah. year. <laughs> yeah, I I I have done course recce, uh, oh. but I've also done well in races that I haven't seen, but before. But it's it's just different. But I think. Uh, the biggest advantage is to return to a race you've raced. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, because it's so different. Um, but yeah. that's, that's just me. I think as well it could be like sometimes, you know, it's very uh, – sometimes it's just – maybe even best not to know what, what's Yeah, about. not to know what's coming up. Yeah. Like, it's like being – the, being the blind and just deal with it when it comes so yeah. in these races so I don't <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic advice thank you very much for that I just you should, you should, yeah and you shouldn't trust people in front of you oh no <laughs> I've been that person I've led people the wrong way that's... before in a race in Sweden yeah, I actually did that <laughs> which race <laughs> it was the iceberg um experience um it was three days of racing it was absolutely fantastic near um it was kind of it, oh it's near stugby ramsvik stugby and camping in um the okay. southwest somewhere near the coast yeah it was absolutely amazing but there was all these markers and then i sort of missed one and i sort of followed this path that went up there and like about five people followed me and then i was just like oh oh they're all following me i was like don't follow me i've gone the wrong way <laughs> <laughs> it was really embarrassing <laughs> uh. But I just wanted to read out some comments from the live chat because we've got tons of people watching um, and they're all really appreciating all your really candid and honest answers. Um, so we've got a hello from Carl Southgate. We've got um, John Gardner's watching from the USA. Um, we've got um, Adrian Camilleri, whose questions we just answered. He says, hi from yeah. MTA. Uh, oh, and he, um, and he means Malta. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and he, he also says he wishes he could relocate to Switzerland on a whim so yeah I think people are envious of your choice of lifestyle there um, and uh, John Earp says hi to all as well and Nigel Barnett says good evening and Guy, um, Guy Greatrex is here as well um, but John Gardner has said something really nice um, and I just want to let you know this is the general thoughts of what everyone's thinking right now and there uh, John says it's easy to see why everyone loves Mimi she's very sincere and an honest person thanks for having her on <laughs> So, oh, that's nice. <laughs> it's easier to be sincere. <laughs> yeah, it is, isn't it? <laughs> but I was just 
I, I just wanted to say something about the lifestyle choice. Mm. You know, when uh, when we decided to change our life, we had this. Uh, we sold a big house we had renovated, um, and for some of the money we earned on that, we rented a tiny apartment in uh, in the Italian Alps for half a year. Mm. Um, and then we, before we went off, we had this big going away party with a lot of people, and everyone that came was like, "Oh, you're so lucky! You're so lucky to get to do this." And you're like, um, I'm not lucky. We chose uh, this. <laughs> we, and, <laughs> and then, and the the point is, no, we're not more lucky than everyone else in the in that going away party. We just made other choices because everyone could have done the same thing, but they just didn't do it. So I think it's um, uh, without like saying, I think that um, people are, I mean, uh, it's easy to say, but you're so lucky, but it's it's not about luck at all. It's about prioritizing. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I uh, prioritizing what's right for your family um, and the you and the people that are close to you you decide what you want to do with your your life and then you make you make the stuff you need to do to get there and there's like that's that's I think that's how you should do it <laughs> yeah I totally agree and I totally understand because people are say to me I, I tell people what my job yeah. is and um and they're like oh you're so lucky and it's like there's no luck about it I worked really really hard to get this job yeah I know <laughs> and I love I, it it's great <laughs> but I I'm just I didn't just wake up one morning and just give like no one gave me this job I just made it up <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, I know exactly Maybe what you mean. You probably worked really hard for it, and and also like made uh, well, choices to take you there. That, yeah. That that has. I mean, because you cannot get, you cannot have everything in life. No. <laughs> so you often. I mean, if you want a specific thing, you have to uh, take away something else. If you want to. Live in, live in this uh, environment, maybe you need to live in a one bedroom apartment instead of a big house. And it's like, you can, yeah. So you, you make your, your priority list and you stick to that one. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I totally get you. And um, I know one of the people watching right now, he actually did exactly what you've done. And he took, his, he took a van and he moved to Chamonix for this summer. He's back now in Birmingham. But he um, is Carl Southgate. He went out to Chamonix and he was there for the UTMB. And I went over. We actually met up and we were able to do some running together there. And he was just saying it was brilliant living from his van and just doing whatever he liked. And, and now it's back back down to earth with a bump because yeah he had to go back for the winter <laughs> and earn some money yeah but, it, but I mean, yeah but that's what we do too, you know we need, we need to go back and yeah yeah fill up there yeah, well, I think it's great what you've done, and it's absolutely amazing. And I want to move now to talk on a bit about something else, which is a big part of your life, which is food, and therefore this Moon Valley Diaries book, which you've co-authored with Emily Forsberg and Ida um, Nielsen, who we had on last week at the live chat. And so um, I've got a few questions from audience members as well um but this is going to be your specialist subject area because you actually have a master's in molecular nutrition am i right in yes saying? yes yeah brilliant <laughs> so how did your involvement in um moon valley begin like what is moon valley for anyone who doesn't know and how did you get involved so it was actually uh, during a uh, templation 2017 uh that me and Ida and emily <laughs> kind of spoke um, spoke about uh, starting uh, a nutrition brand called the uh, Moon Valley. Uh, well, the name came later, but the idea came. <laughs> and for me, I worked uh, a bit with like products and not may not the production side. Uh, uh, actually, I worked with food supplements, but more like a technical writer. Mm -hmm. But I had. I, I felt like, oh, I want to do something on my own. And then Eden um, and Emily are like, yeah, <laughs> yes, people. <laughs> so <laughs> they were, they, they were, uh, um, so I, when I approached them, they said like, yeah, of course, we want to do that too. And, and that was like the, then it felt like it was something uh, 
we needed to do because I mean you it's the fun lies in being several people and the thing I think the thing with us three is that we have I mean we're very different as you will notice on these uh, three uh, interviews where we have very different um, running journeys um, and uh, but we have the, we share a lot of like values our core values are very similar and you feel that when you get to know a person you feel it kind of straight away that you just connect uh in a on a deeper level and i i i think we we really have the same way of thinking about food and training and the environment so we decided to start this company and then it became a book too which is um, super fun mm -hmm. yeah and did you enjoy writing your bits of the book was it difficult or did you just like write away and it came naturally uh, this no this was really a, a project that I think it it was uh, easy the hard thing was cutting away stuff <laughs> <laughs> we, yeah we could, I think we could have made a lot and we just made like this uh, because it's very it's it follows the year it's mm -hmm. a calendar basically with with um, training and eating and like sustainability thoughts throughout the year uh, and we just made like a calendar we had a workshop with our um, with our editor and and stuff and we just like took out this note Emily took these notes with for all the different months and we just start starting to have ideas and it was just so much I, so many ideas but so then we just picked and then we wrote it yeah uh, but yeah. I've, so I've and just like uh, I think we we were very synced we have a bit of a different um, I mean, Ida took a bit more of the training specific parts of the books, book because she's really good in that area. And I, of course, took more, perhaps more of the like nutrition stuff. And then Emily got the hard stuff like the mindfulness piece and stuff. <laughs> she's really good at that as well, isn't she? Yeah, yeah all the yoga really and stuff to, she's done. It's easy. It's easy to just uh, write what's in, what's good about eating uh, <laughs> nettles and stuff, but it's hard to describe this more. Uh, yeah, the more ethereal things. Stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we've got a. It was it was a pleasure writing it. Brilliant, and and also the writing is lovely, and there's loads of really cool recipes in there that I'm going to have to try. But also, you've got this amazing illustrator yeah. to illustrate a double page every time there's a new month, and they're just beautiful, aren't they? Like, I yeah, just, it's, just uh, buy the book just to look at those as well. <laughs> it's our friend Max Rumi. Uh, he's a really he, I, he, he makes films and stuff, but he also, he's a really good uh, sketcher, I yeah. think. Uh, and he uh, he paints a lot of his outdoor adventures and stuff, so. Yeah, yeah. it's just beautiful. Talented. Like, I've seen illustrations in books before, but they're never usually watercolors, and it just, they're just beautiful. Like, look at this one from May. It's just like, look at those mountains, just really inspiring. And yeah, yeah. And the recipes is, are great. It, Oh, sorry. It is that. the Moon Valley Farm. Yeah. So, yeah. and the book is based around uh, the farm where Emily lives, yeah. and uh, and Ida lives close by as well. And it's like the, um, because it's uh, like the spiritual <laughs> starting point of the book and the company as well. So. Yeah, and you make um, nutrition bars and like energy drinks, and there's some chocolate as well. Um, what would you What would you say is your favorite product that you you guys make? Uh, well, I, you shouldn't say what your favorite product is. No, but I, I <laughs> the beetroot bar is really Ooh. good though. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. beetroot, beetroot and orange, and then mm. chocolate. Chocolate is chocolate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, with a, if you have, we're like, oh, well, let's make sports products. But we have to have chocolate. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a sports product. I've taken chocolate with me, or like, especially afterwards. Yeah, you want some chocolate. No, you? but uh, as a nutritionist, uh, I can tell you that dark chocolate is health food. 
exactly. <laughs> I've heard that before as well, and you've just corroborated that. No, but it's true. It's a, it's eighty five percent. So it is actually like a it's 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 good stuff. <laughs> it tastes gorgeous. We we had a run where some of my audience members we all met up and we tasted some of your products and they got a resounding thumbs up from everybody, especially the chocolate. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, <laughs> I, yeah. Think I, I just wrestled visited, it from I them. Just vis- <laughs> I visit. I just visited the chocolate factory. It's a small mm-hmm. one in south of Sweden, and mm-hmm. they because they're making our raspberry eighty five percent chocolate. Oh, wow. uh, they made it like a week ago, and I was there watching it. <laughs> and I was like, so that's Did a weird. It? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's a weird but super nice thing to be able to do. Uh, yeah, it sounds wonderful. And so we have got a couple of questions on nutrition um, uh, from audience members. So um, uh, Adrian Camilleri wants to know, um, have your food choices affected your running or is it the other way around? Does your food choice affect your running? Um, yeah, so yeah, would you eat differently, I suppose, if you weren't a runner? Uh- yeah, so no, I would probably not eat that differently. I would eat less, mm. uh, that's for sure, because uh, <laughs> otherwise, uh, uh, so you eat, you have a, a greater need for for uh, for energy when you train a lot, but it's really like when you train a lot uh, mm. for just like the everyday uh, everyday. P- person working out a few days a week i wouldn't say it 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 affects your it affects your health in in so many ways but not the amount of energy you need not in that way but when you when you do a lot of hours you have to eat enough huh? mm-hmm. uh, and it, i think that's one of the biggest problems for a lot of high level endurance athletes it's actually covering their um their uh, basic caloric needs <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah you have to eat so was, much yeah but I was I was a nutritionist uh, I've been a foodie and like super interested in healthy food for as long as I re- can remember and I was a nutritionist before I became a runner mm. so I was probably even I was probably even eating better <laughs> when I before I started running <laughs> than I do now because uh-huh. I had more time oh, <laughs> yeah so, so I, had, I had a really a really good like base of uh, healthy wholesome um, nutrition nutritious um, started and I think that might be one of the reasons why why it went so well so fast but yeah really yeah and yeah. um, what's your so you've got less time nowadays what would be your go-to quick really healthy nutritious meal for after a run oh well uh, after a run I, I well that's the thing it's uh, it's a lot about what you like uh, I like to eat if I if I go for a long run I like to eat um, like real food uh, mm-hmm. uh, like a big meal <laughs> yeah dinner or lunch like a a proper big meal, like cooked with uh, whatever, um, and then a dessert and stuff. So I, I'm not so uh, after long training. I don't really like to take just like a snack or something. Um, but it's very different. Yeah, it, 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 it it's different during the year. Now oh, yeah. when, in this in this season, it's a lot of root veggies and pumpkin and like ro- mm-hmm. oven roasted stuff and soups and stews. Stew, stews. You're uh, making me hungry. I haven't eaten dinner yeah, yet. Yeah, but it's, 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 it's season, huh? and in the summer you eat completely different. So yeah. yeah, and that's what's reflected in the book, isn't it? That you have a different um, uh, set of ingredients based on what's yeah. coming out of the farm. It's really interesting. Yeah, for example, in the in the springtime, I will probably have nettle soup like once a day mm-hmm. <laughs> because I love it and it's super, super nutritious. Mm. Uh, but it's it's a short season for that. So and then you move on to something else. Yeah. So yeah, n- now it's a lot of pumpkin. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. When I spoke to Ida last week, she just finished making um, pumpkin, uh, no, m- like mushroom pasta, like handmade pasta with pumpkin sauce on it, and it oh, it just sounded delicious. But you know, she's 
she's an, a, an amazing cook. <laughs> so yeah. it's like her food is really delicious. Oh, lovely. Oh, well, yeah. we know where we need to go for dinner. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then there's another question here um, from Graham Guy. Um, he wants to know if you are a vegan or not. And um, and if you are, did it change your performance? Um, yeah. yeah. So, so what are your thoughts around diet and and, uh, yeah, running. so no, I, I'm not. I'm not. A, I'm not a vegan. Uh, I eat. Uh, I was for a couple of years actually, mm-hmm. um, but it was. Um, I I decided to do it uh, both as an experiment, perhaps because I'm interested in it, but also mainly as a as a political uh, thing to because I didn't want to support the. the the animal industry mm-hmm. <laughs> and the ways animal are the way animals are treated but yeah. uh, for me i had prob- problems um uh, i was struggling with with feeling a hundred percent on a solely plant-based diet and it's very individual and i know and I, I know a lot of people that really thrive on that diet but for me it was um i I didn't. I don't think my motivation was strong enough as, as well. Mm. Um, maybe if it was really strong, eth- ethically driven, to just feel like disgusted by eating animals, I think then you have no choice. You cannot do it. Yeah. So, but for me, it was more. It was more political. So I, I made. So I, I eat a mainly plant-based diet, but sometimes I have like local cheese and eggs from good places and I even eat uh, wild game sometimes and fish so yeah. but it's the base is definitely plant-based but it's um, I think uh, uh, I think you can I think you can eat well on very a lot of different diets I think the human body is health wise I think you can manage really well following a lot of different body diets because we're omnivores and we we adjust and we also have in we're also individual <laughs> so i i am i stay away from the diet dogmas as far as i can actually i i think for me it's about just trying to um be more connected to i've, I've chosen the uh, road of trying to be more connected to where the food I eat comes from mm-hmm. and maybe have like an environmental perspective on it and also I think I just encourage people to to care about where they, their food comes from and uh, cook on their own <laughs> not just buy pre-made stuff uh, I think that's the biggest investment you can do for your health when it comes to food is probably to learn how to cook your own food Mm. yeah yeah even if it's not handmade pasta (laughs) yeah it doesn't have to be it can be something really just but it's just that uh, if you 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 need to have this connect i think you need this connection to where the food comes from i mean it's um yeah yeah. Then you make your choices based on that uh, as well. And it, as far as the vegan discussion, that's really easy when you when you're clear about where food comes from. I mean, meat is dead animals, and if you see that it is that when you cook it, then yeah, you make the right choice on what's right for you. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, it's good advice, isn't it? Because like uh, after Scott Jurek. Um, he went slowly ve- vegetarian and then became more vegan and vegan and he saw his performance just do like go up like that and there's a it's a it's quite trendy at the moment for people to be vegan or plant based and and I've tried it in the past too but I just find that yeah maybe because I'm not totally dedicated to finding all those sources of of all the different nutrients that you need um, I've had to go back to eating fish and go back to eating meat but it's more of like a once a week kind of treat thing um, and also I like like the taste as well it's like if any yeah. vegans are watching they'll be like down with Claire but um but yeah I just um if it's got from a good butcher and locally sourced then I'm happier to eat it um but yeah I've got friends who are totally vegan and they thrive on that so I think what you said is totally right like we have to just make the choice for ourselves yeah and maybe I mean for me maybe there is um, a time when when the life when life looks different and it will be perfect 
I don't know, but I, I mean, of course, it's a very gentle, gentle and good way of eating. Uh, but it's, um, it's also, uh, yeah, you have to, you have to see what's right for you. And it's like that. It's you should. I mean, you have to, you have to be very critical when you if you go on restrictive diets like low carb or um this uh, or a vegan diet and that's a diet that's very restrictive that when you take away a lot of different uh, food groups uh, well a di- i wouldn't say a vegan diet you, t- you don't take away so much but let's say other restrictive diets you have to i mean maybe you're inspired because you read a book and you uh, and then you should try, but you sh- you have to be honest with yourself about how you're actually feeling. I think, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> because what's right for someone else might not be right for you. And maybe you should even ask someone close by in your family, yeah, <laughs> so that you're not turning into an asshole, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like grumpy all the time and feeling like <laughs> shit and stuff. Oh, I'm, but I'm following this diet; it's supposed <laughs> to make me super happy. But yes, but you're also becoming an asshole. So please, don't. <laughs> no, but. Yeah. No, but you have to. You have to feel. You have to be um, be a bit of your own sci- scientist there and check, like, how am I actually feeling? How am I performing ha- as a person and in my training? I mean, yeah. Yeah. And if it's not working, you you figure something else out. Yeah, yeah. I like that. Be your own scientist. I like that. Um, yeah. I've just got time for a couple more questions from the audience. Um, there's one about leg pain here. So John Gardner wants to know, he's still trying to figure out his ultra race nutrition to stave off leg pain. Um, so for, for Mimi, I'd like to know um, what they eat and drink to keep their legs happy on an ultra run. There is nothing you can drink in it to keep the legs happy for a whole <laughs> ultra run. <laughs> Sorry. Well said. I may, maybe does he mean cramp? Like uh, no, he might mean yeah, like a cramping kind cramps, of thing. Yes. Yeah. I, I I actually think that um, for the leg pain, it's it's probably the best thing you can do is do uh, a lot of. Uh, running in the type of environment that the race is going to be. And after that, it's for ultra race nutrition, it's it's very specific to you. Uh, because I, I get a lot of questions about, oh, what should I eat during an ultra? And I, I cannot tell you because what I will suggest might, you might up. <laughs> I think you need to um, you need to find uh, the food that you can stomach, uh, and it's basically as simple as that. And a lot, of course, a lot as much energy as as you feel comfortable ingesting as well. But maybe for avoiding cramps and stuff, cramp is by definition um, cramp is most often you get cramps because you're over uh, your muscles get overused and mm. they're not used uh, they're they're uh, they're tired um, but some cramps are actually due to salt and uh, like deficient electrolyte deficiencies yeah. um, so that's also and th- that might be something to really think about especially that's also individual huh? but if you're a person that sweats a lot or if the race is in a hot place you really need to have like an electrolyte strategy for your race how are you going to get them in? I, I usually carry salt tablets. This small, it looks like, uh, yeah, it's just like a normal tablet and then you have electrolytes in them because it really, it's really easy to just take them. And then, of course, the sports products, uh, they they have electrolytes in them as well, but you, you need to have have a plan based on how much you sweat and how hot the race is going to be. Yeah. yeah. Don't, I never drink plain water, but mm-hmm. that's uh, you can do that if you take uh, or well, that's not true. I do drink plain water, <laughs> no, but I <laughs> no, it's not true because sometimes you drink water if you find a well and stuff. Yeah, <laughs> but if yeah, the aid stations, I choose the isotonic stuff. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. 
Great. That's a really ha- that's really helpful. Um, John Gardner says thanks very much for that on the live chat. So that's really cool. Um, and then we have time just for one final quick question here um, from Guy GreaterX. He wants to know what is the best trail run in Sweden um, because he's thinking of going for a long weekend. Ah, uh, w- well. Are the best, yeah, oh, it's hard, huh? <laughs> it depends on, Sweden is such a long country. It depends on where you are. But there's some really nice, like, old um, traditional uh, hiking routes in the north. Uh-huh. And then you can hike between, uh, so you hike between these really nice mountain huts. Um, um, but you can also run because it's like 15, 16, 20K between uh, each of them. Um, so maybe I would do something like that for a weekend, like the Jämtlands Triangel. It's like in the north of Sweden. Uh, and then we have like our most famous hiking route. It's called Kungsleden. Oh, it's the like one the route, Emily did. The real route. Yeah, she, she ran it all in once. Yeah, <laughs> no, she set a record, really, didn't she? Yeah. But it's... Uh, that's also a nice one yeah uh, it dep- depends on the season though you have to do it in skis in the winter but it's uh, it de- yeah it depends but the fall early fall in uh, the Swedish mountains are really nice like September is the best month oh, to really? go because then all the mosquitoes are then it, that's the colors are beautiful and uh, the sun is shining and if you yeah it's really nice wow that's brilliant so, right, we're all going to go to the Moon Valley Farm <laughs> and <Yeah>. camp out, <laughs> say hi to Emily and uh, and do some trail running. That's absolutely yeah. fantastic. Um, okay, that's brilliant. So um, I've I've answered all the questions now from everybody um, and everybody's um, had a really good time. Um, Carl Espenberger has joined us from Australia. It's his first live oh. stream. So obviously the new time is working well for the Australians. Um, and John Gardner, who... Um, had the question about the leg pain um he said interesting discussion thank you Mimi and Claire so that's really cool as well um yeah and lots of people loving you on the live chat there as well and we've had a really good turnout for this new time so that's really awesome um that's good for you <laughs> yeah it's good it's really good um so yeah it's been absolutely brilliant to chat to you tonight Mimi and I just want to say thank you so much on behalf of everybody for coming along and just sparing you've spared nearly an hour now <laughs> so thanks very yeah. much thanks Claire <laughs> and um and I just want to just recommend the book to everybody because I've got a copy here and I'm just really enjoying leafing through it and I think I might yeah, start in nice. January and make like one thing from yeah. it every month and just use it yeah, as a diary should. as it should be yeah but yeah is there anything else you wanted to say that's the idea yeah that's the idea yeah no <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah I just no I it's just uh you show you show the book and it's like this is uh I'm very proud of this book because it's um it's salsa uh and it's uh the editor was like it's a weird training book <laughs> I don't know what to make of it but it's it's charming and I'm like we we're like yeah because it's us it's just uh it's just not it's it's filled it's filled with like race reports and uh, training tips but it's also a lot of other stuff in there too and it all connects <laughs> yeah it's really good it's just not like any other training book that you'd find I think it's really refreshing it's really beautiful and it's really heartfelt so I just want to oh, say nice. thanks for creating this A's yeah. book um, and yeah. lots of lots of other people are saying thanks on the live chat as well Guy Greatrex says thank you and John Earp says great to hear from Mimi thank you <laughs> so fantastic um so we're gonna end the live chat now um yeah thanks for coming on and um oh i forgot to ask you what you're doing next have you got any races planned for 2020 I'll just quickly <laughs> yeah trans Gran canaria it's too early but i need to do it <laughs> yeah wow that sounds brilliant okay well, so we'll all follow you on social media cool race huh yeah it looks amazing. It looks absolutely amazing. Um, and I've just uh, said, John Earp also says, the book is now on my Christmas list to Santa. <laughs> and Nigel oh. Barnett says, thank you to Mimi as well. And Guy Greatrex says that you're a lovely lady. 
how oh, that's nice. <laughs> that's so British to be a lovely lady. <laughs> yes, you're a lady. You need a cup of tea now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> fantastic. Well, it's been amazing having you on tonight. Um, and good luck um, at Trans Gran Canaria. That will be absolutely fantastic. Everybody follow Mimi on social media and see how she gets on. Um, so yeah, thanks very much, Mimi. I'm going to end the live chat now. Bye, yeah. everyone. Bye, guys.